This is 15 Minutes of Freedom. I'm your host, Elite Life Optimization Coach Ryan Nidell, coming to you yet once again, final day, down in Costa Rica, Rhythmia Life Advancement Center. And we're recording this on a Sunday, but I'm going to say it's a Saturday, and my wife is with me not only in the studio, but in the hotel room as we're recording this. That's right. Hello, everyone from Costa Rica. It is our last official day here. What do you think about this? Right? Because I've been, <laughs> I've been going live on this or sharing my story yeah. all throughout this. You know that. Right. You had, you had apprehension coming here. Oh, big time. And it's funny. I've gotten messages throughout the week, right? The, uh, on Instagram, Facebook, just a bunch of DMs about, you know, did you, did you do it? Did you like it? How was the experience? Because the podcast that we had come out are, you know, about Rhythmia before we came here, I was not sure on not only what to expect, but if I was going to participate in any of the plant medicine ceremonies. Um, because in my mind, I just wanted a vacation. I just wanted to go on vacation. I wanted to not have a schedule and I wanted to chill and I wanted to go to the beach and I wanted to hike the jungle and see monkeys and volcanoes and just things. Right. So we get here and it, we get an instant schedule and I was like, oh shit. (laughs) But what's amazing is now at the back part of the week, we've seen monkeys we saw volcanoes in the distance and we had our feet on the beach. Yeah. For for a, a total of 20 minutes, all three combined. I love that you <laughs> take this to the negative. It's not it not taking the negative. It's factual. It is factual. It is factual. But yes, I, I was apprehensive of about doing any of it to begin with. And I just thought, well, you know, we're going to we're going to wing it here. Here we go. And that we did. And we did, we totally, we, we just went for it. So the first day that we got here, um, you know, the flight is long, but not terrible from Columbus. It was the longest flight we had was four and a half hours. We had a connection in Charlotte, not that big of a deal. We get there. Um, you know, I'm sure that if you've listened to the story of the podcast, Ryan's told you, we get picked up in a, a van. It's very nice. Uh, I got a little bit car sick, right? It was very, very hot. I, I get car sick in cars if I'm in the back. And we were in the back of the bus and I was not feeling so hot. So by the time we got to Rhythmia, I'm like, man, I don't know. This is rough already. And it was beautiful. It was clean. It was welcoming. The people were amazing. Um, the staff was kind and attentive and it was just, it was awesome. Definitely five-star resort. When you pull up here, you're like, holy cow, I had no idea this is what it was going to be. Yes. And it's, this resort, again, sits on a property that is already very well, I'll say protected, secluded, right? There could be that thought in your mind of, okay, Costa Rica, it's not exactly, right? You're not, you're not exactly going to Orange County, California, right? Right. And so you pull into a complex that is gated where you have to get approval to come in. And then as you drive what feels like two, three, four miles into this complex. Yeah. It's quite back here, right? Yeah. You still have to get into another gate entrance actually into Rhythmia. And both these gate entrances have guards would give you the idea that they have like a gun or something. No. And there's nothing like that. It's but the regular they, security guards. Yeah. They're, they're manned, right? And you got to check in and make sure that things are, are good. So that already creates this at least feeling of safety to me. And not that I ever felt unsafe, but it's a foreign country. You don't know anybody. It's right. like most people, me included, right? I had to look on a map to realize where Costa Rica was even located. It's freaking out here. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it, it might as well be Central America. Yes. Right. I mean, it is Central America. It is Central America. And so when we get here, right, you, you get out of the van, you start to feel better, not instantaneously, but rather yeah, quickly. I, just, I mean, there was nothing wrong with me. I just got car sick and I needed to get out. But like you pull up and they have, you know, they greet you with like this uh, fruit flavored water, right? It's everywhere throughout the resort. And they give you a bag with your workbook in it and your water bottle and your room key and your things. And then they brought down freezing cold towels. that was soaked in like essential oil lavender, which was beautiful because I was nauseous and it was, it was heaven. And then, you know, you kind of, they, you, you show up to your room and your bags are already there and everything's already taken care of. But I think when we got here, we immediately had like a, an introductory class. Well, yeah, we got here. We didn't arrive to the resort till almost four, I yeah. believe, three thirty-four. We get our schedule right. We we see the 
the intake process here. You watch a movie in the van that explains what you're going to go through on the way here. You arrive and that you you go through checkpoints, right? They take pictures to make sure that everybody knows who each other are. Yeah, they get your passports and they get you all checked in and you sign your paperwork and all that good stuff. And but it's all very pleasant, right? And it gives you an opportunity to meet people that are coming in in your group, right? There were I think just about sixty people, maybe a little less here with us this week, and you are spending massive amounts of time with these people. And so coming in, you know, when you when you go to a resort and you go on vacation you maybe see the same people a couple of times here and there. And sometimes you connect with some strangers and sometimes you don't. In this, it's so immersive and you're you're all in it for this one reason, right? Um, that you do everything together as a group. And it's really great because it it creates this cohesive family where there's all kinds of connections you didn't realize were going to come about with this experience. Certainly. And my wife at this point, as we have checked in, got our pictures taken, done all the things we have to do. I would call it her grumpopotamus level. Feels like a seven slash eight, realizing that we have oh, a yeah. schedule to <clears throat> adhere to. And oh, she's yeah. like looking for free. She's like, when am I going to go do this? When am I going to do that? And I was like, yeah. just calm down. Everything will present itself. Like just go with it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm looking at the schedule and like the days are jam packed, right? Workshops and, um, introductory classes and guest speakers and breathwork classes and meditation and yoga and just things all day and breakfast, lunch, and dinner at certain times and the plant medicine ceremony starting at certain times and just all these things. And so you have free time, but the free time windows end up being an hour maybe. And that's if you don't have a cleanse scheduled or a massage scheduled. And so it just, I'm in my mind, I'm seeing all these things and I'm like, wait a minute in my head, I wanted a vacation where I didn't have to worry about a schedule because our whole life is schedules. And I'm like, damn it. So yes, on top of being car sick and then getting a schedule, I was grumpopotamus pretty high. Now from the, obviously we, we all have our own sense of what reality is. And I'm the one that has podcast interviews here and, and things that I have committed to as part of this journey. And so I look at the schedule and I see Okay, there's yoga every morning at seven o'clock. I already know I'm out on yoga. Like that's not that's <laughs> I not, was in. That's not gonna be my deal. I know that breakfast is served from seven until nine thirty. That's no big deal to me, right? That's a normal breakfast time. Yeah. There's a class that starts every morning at 930, um, nine thirty. That is sure. Yeah. Nine, great. That is uh, Michael Beckwith class, right? Which is read his books. He's an incredible guy owns the answer is you is what yeah. it's called yeah the, the answer is you and it ends up being some of the foundational pieces of how i live life anyways right I, I don't know if i picked up some of that stuff along the journey or we think the same way doesn't really much matter so we went to the first class the first day because it was i wanted to see it i wanted to to understand what it was from there there's nothing else scheduled until lunchtime that class is from 9 30 or 9 until 10 30 now there's Different things that I chose to do, but didn't have to. Yeah, Lunch- we had some guest speakers, right, from eleven to noon or eleven to twelve thirty, and then there were some other presentations. Luke Sellers spoke this week. We didn't see him. Yeah, we weren't in that class, right? And this, this is what like the the real side of things, right? There's there's a perception that we both had because you get this big list of things. Then there's the reality that most people, as you're listening, probably don't get up on a vacation or on a weekend until after seven, so it's no big deal to get out of bed throw on some clothes, go grab some breakfast, get done with breakfast, go to a class if you want to. It's not mandatory. The, the Yeah, answer, they had two or three classes that were mandatory and then that was it. Yeah, the answer is you is not a mandatory class. Lunch then is served from 12 until 2.30, 2 mm-hmm. o'clock, 2, 2.30, yep. one of those two windows. Right Then there's nothing in the afternoon until, well, the first day, there's... Every day from three to four, there's a plant integration class. Right. And it's so you're introduced to your shamans for the evening and um, the shamans kind of go over what you expect during ceremony, what the medicine entails, what your intentions are. And so, you know, if you've listened to Ryan before, like they speak on very, very clearly the three things that you want to get out of it. You want to show me who I have become merge me back with my soul at all costs and heal my heart. And so if you're unsure of what your intention should be, those are the three ones they set out for you so that you can have a guide through your medicine journey. And then that 
also helps the shamans to know how to guide you through the journey. Yeah. And so that's from, you know, three to four every day. When I say every day, Monday through Thursday, Friday and Saturday, that's not the case. Then the medicine journey starts at 530. Yeah. And really 530, it could have just as easily been six. Like we sat outside, like they scan you in. There's these really cool that they become a nuisance sometimes, but they're little key fobs that everywhere you go, you scan in. So like Jerry's really big on tracking data to see where yeah. you're at and what your experience is versus what you've done. Like he correlates all the data points. And so really the blocks of time you would have open are if you didn't go to any class, you would have all day until three and then from 4.30 to six open. Right. And of course we scheduled, you know, when you book your package, you get um, three deep sea cleanses, which end up being colonics and they're continuous run colonics, right? So for 40 minutes, you stick a tube up your rear end and you... Magic. <laughs> Man, two, two, I only got to do two it twice and each time I had such incredible relief <laughs> yeah. that... I pushed hard enough that the tube came out. Yeah. And I had to twice. Pump. Both times. Yeah. The yep. first time I just laid there like I don't know what to do. Second time my wife coached me through how to clean out <laughs> the system and the tube and to use what, the hose. what a bonding experience that is. We've had so much bonding recently with with the back end of our life, but it's it's fine. So yes, the deep sea cleanses end up being really wonderful, a little different, right? It's continuous water flowing through your rectum at all times and you're just washing yourself out. And it's really, it's actually, it's very nice. Like you feel lighter and better and like things are stagnant, right? It's gut health is so important. And so they know this here. It's, it's important to your gut brain barrier. There, that is a proven thing. So that if your gut's healthy, your brain functions better. Um, and so we we did the cleanses. We did a massage that's also part of the package, which was freaking amazing. Uh, just everything has been top notch. But let's get into the nitty gritty because I know that people that are listening are tuning in because they want to hear about the plant medicine ceremonies and they want to hear about the four nights of experience. Certainly. And I, I've covered mine. I'll give not give you, but encourage you to take open form. Like I'll yeah. give the rundown quick reader's digest version. Listen to, you know, four other episodes this week to get more of an insight on mine. But first night we, we come here the first day, check in on a Sunday, Monday, we had the first class with, with Jerry. He explains the four types of different experiences you could have with the fourth being called a nada, which is where you don't physically feel anything. You basically sleep through the whole experience. He says, it's the most incredible thing. You should be so fortunate for it all this stuff, right? And admittedly, he brings it up that it seems like a sales pitch. It's like a gimmick thing. Like if yeah. it doesn't work, just know it's okay. It's not supposed to work. And of course, I'm the one that gets a nada. Like not, like I literally went up for two doses and fell asleep. Like, yeah. So the, yeah, the, the categories are you, it was um, Pinta. Not, uh, Pinta was the first one and Pinta is like all of the shapes, colors, the sacred geometry, um, that you see whether your eyes are open or closed. And then there was the contra, what I think is contra, which is a conversation, right? That somebody is talking to you. Like it would be what they call the mother ayahuasca is talking to you and guiding you through showing you things, taking you back to places. And then of course the surgeries, I don't know if that's part of the deal. I can't remember at this point. Everything's a blur. But then the nada. The nada is like you get nothing. And it's crazy because I don't think the nada is actually nada. I think that you you go to sleep and your the medicine works on you in ways that you're not aware of. Yeah, And, it, and that's a gift. It is. I mean, I track and monitor my sleep, obviously. Um, that's something I'm passionate about. So between the aura and the whoop, I had five hours and 15 minutes yeah. of uninterrupted sleep during that evening, right? Starting basically at eight and going till two in the morning, plus or minus, give or take with that experience. And so I know I was sleeping. It wasn't like, a, oh yeah, sure. Like you're just so out of it. Like, no, no, no. I like woke up when they turned the lights back yeah. on and I went to the center and everybody shared and I'm like, man, I feel great. And everybody else is groggy and oh. out of it. And I'm like, what's next? Like so I'm ready to go. Monday night, Monday night was, um, our first ayahuasca ceremony. It was led by two women from Germany. They were German shamans. It was Peruvian tradition. And I was a little hesitant about all of this, right? And so I walk into the Maloka, which is the area that you do the um, ceremony. And there are beds 
everywhere. And I, if you've listened to Ryan, you, you kind of heard the description. There are single twin beds, actual mattresses with fresh white linens and a fresh pillow and a fresh blanket, a big fuzzy, like fleecy, super comfy blanket. And then at the end of each bed is a bucket and a roll of toilet paper. And so I walk in and I'm like, man, I knew it was coming. But when you see the reality of it, you're like, holy shit. So you walk in the Maloka and the shamans have set up all of um, what they call their altar, which is beautiful, right? It's all the, the traditional ancient forms of the ceremony for this medicine. It's incredible. Just the tradition, the, um, the culture in it, it's, it's beautiful. And so each shaman has the different cultures that they were either brought up in or trained in or, you know, as part of their ancestry. And so to see the German women, just all of their stuff, their, their crystals and their altar and the ayahuasca up there. And it was just, it was beautiful. And they had blown, um, smoke and incense and they, they use tobacco smoke and, and different types of incense to fill the room and clear the energy, right? Because it's a, it's a sacred space. It really is. And you can feel it when you walk in there. And it's funny because each night that we walked into the Maloka, the energy was different because it was the, whatever energy that particular shaman was bringing to the experience. And so the energy was always very warm each night we walked in Monday night felt, um, a little ominous to me because I was, I was nervous. I was really nervous. And when we say nervous, like guys, I was shaking and I was like crying. I was in tears as we were in line. And so you go and you pick a bed and, um, Ryan and I did not want to be next to each other. Originally we were told to be together. And then Jerry in the introduction said, you know, if you're here as a couple or, you know, brother, sister, or mom, daughter, or whatever it is, if you are here and your family members, you should not be together because it, you're going to worry about your spouse, wife, daughter, girlfriend, whatever it is. And it will take away from your personal experience. And when you fight too much, it gets worse. And so we said, okay, we'll, we'll sit somewhere where we can actually see each other. So we kind of anchored the room. I was by one door and he was by the other and we were cat a corner to each other and we could see each other, but we were not next to each other. So our energy fields were not going to cross. And if you've been listening to us for a while, you know, Ryan and I are very connected. And so we can feel each other's energy immediately at all times. And we just thought, okay, we're going to give this a shot. Jerry's way. We're not going to sit next to each other. So we go up and we get called to line. The shamans explain, we sit in a circle as a group. The shamans explain what's going to happen. And as far as how we're introduced to ceremony, they ask any questions, how to set your intentions. And then we get in line for the ayahuasca. And so the medicine is presented in a little cup, which looks a little bit bigger than a shot glass, maybe a double shot. Cause it took me a couple of swallows to get it down and I'm standing in line and I'm in tears and Ryan comes behind me and he's just like calmly putting his hand on my shoulder and just, you know, encouraging me to just take a deep breath and calm down. And if I didn't want to participate, I didn't have to, it was just something in my soul that said, get your shit together. You're going to be fine. Just go and do this. And honestly, what I was most nervous about is that we are with a complete group of strangers and we know there is going to be massive amounts of purging. And here's the thing. I've talked about this before. I am super private about bodily functions. Ryan and I have been together for years. I don't go to the bathroom in front of him. If I am sick and have the stomach bug and I'm puking, I don't want anybody near me. Like just leave me alone. I I'm a private person. I don't like to share any of that. And in turn, like, unless you're Gianna and sick, I will get you a cold towel for your head and a glass of water and a bucket if you need one, if you can't make it to the bathroom, but then I'm out. That's it. I'm not, I don't, I don't do well with sick people. Now, Gianna's a whole different story, right? I made that child. She's mine. I don't care if she could throw up in my face. It wouldn't bother me. But everybody else, it's like, man, just keep your shit to yourself, literally. And so that was the biggest hurdle for me coming in on Monday. Like my personal boundaries were so tested just walking in that room because we are spending seven hours in a room ill with strangers. I was like, you got to be fucking kidding me. There's no way. But it's one of those things like this was my first lesson. It was already my first lesson. I was going in there to get over the bullshit about bodily functions and, and, privacy for me, right? Personally. 
So we go up. The shaman pours the cup of medicine, blesses it. You speak your intention, whether audibly or not, into the cup, and then you drink it. And it doesn't taste awful. It's like a really heavy tea. Um, and it just... I mean, it's not great. I wouldn't want to have a cup of it for fun, but it's it's palatable enough to get it down. So a couple of swallows and then you go back and you sit at your bed. They tell you to sit down for 20 minutes and just go into your breath and kind of meditate. So that's what I did. I went and sat back down and after 20 minutes, I laid down on my bed and everybody goes through the same routine. They go and lay down on your bed and, and the biggest thing they tell you is to just mind your own business. Everybody's experience is going to be different. Everybody's here for a different reason. They have multiple shamans and assistants throughout the entire room. So if somebody needs help with something or someone's having a bad time or, or something, anything, there is somebody that is there to help them, but it's not going to be you. So they tell everybody to mind their own business. <clears throat> so I had introduced myself to the people next to me on either side. And we all just said, you know, like, <laughs> here we go. We lay down. And it probably wasn't for an hour and a half or so until I started to feel something. Now, in that hour and a half, there are people that start to vomit. And I'm like, you got to be kidding me. It just instantly, I was like, oh my God, I'm not going to make it. Like panic mode set in for me. And I, I just, I didn't know what to do with myself. And so I brought earplugs, which was my saving grace. And I put earplugs in and I just went into my breath and meditated and, and counted my breath and repeated my intention and just in my head. And so I could hear my breath going through my body and I couldn't hear much of the purging that was going on around me. They play music throughout this whole time and the music is really beautiful. And it's, as I learned now at the end of the week, the music is to set the tone for the medicine to work through you. And the music is used to help the shamans conduct what they want to happen with the energy in the room. And I didn't understand the first night how much work and talent and gift the shamans have with their responsibility on taking on people during this experience because the energy is nuts. Everybody has a different thing that they're going through personally, good or bad. And these shamans are truly gifts from God because they can read what you need and they instantly find you. So Monday night was purgatory for me, honestly, not only with the boundaries being tested of everybody puking and everybody screaming or crying or laughing or yawning or just there were so many things going on that I'm like, man, well, then my journey personally started happening. And I saw the Pinta, right? I started to see all the geometric shapes. My body got very, very hot. And like it started out as warm and then I was hot and my joints were on fire. And I'm like, oh my God, what in the hell did I do to myself? This is, this is ridiculous. And I started to panic a little and kind of got into my own head like, shit, this is never going to stop. I'm fucked. And I remember the shaman kept saying, what is coming is going. And so I started to repeat that to myself, like what is coming is going, what is coming is going. So I, it was very strange. I started hearing this voice and this voice was myself. Like the narrative throughout my whole week was always me. And some people heard their grandparents themselves, the mother, ayahuasca, like had a different voice or a different language, but mine was always myself. Just started telling me all these crazy things about you know, you don't have to carry the shame. You don't have to carry the guilt. You don't have to feel like this. And I'm like, what the fuck? I feel fine. Like my life is beautiful. What the hell's going on? And the more that she said this, or I said this to myself, the more these visions started to come about all the things that I had swallowed, like the shame and guilt about being a divorced woman, about not creating the space for Gianna that I had envisioned for my life, about fucking her up because she was going to come from a divorced family about having, you know, to watch her go through things with her dad that I wasn't able to control. 
And I'm just like, fuck, I can't, I can't fix things for her. Like, what can I do? Right. He, he, he's a totally different person than I am. He's on a different path. He doesn't think the way I think he doesn't develop the way that I develop. And that's okay. Right. That's his path. But now Gianna's got to deal with that. And I'm just like, fuck, he made me feel so small and so fucked up for so many years. He's going to do that to her. And I can't protect her from that. Like just shit that I've never said out loud to anybody in the world ever period. And my heart ripped open and I started sobbing like I have never cried before in my entire life. And I'm just like, what is happening? And I rolled over to my side and I just curled up in the fetal position and my whole body seized up and I just wailed. Like, I don't know how loud I was. I don't know how long I cried, but as Every time I cried and every time the the tears came out, I swear to you, each tear had a different meaning and there were buckets of them. And it was just like all these years of suppressed crying because I'm not a crier, right? I'm not a fucking crier. I'm sitting in a room with 60 people and I am fucking sobbing and wailing. Talk, Talk about personal boundaries. At that point, I had no idea who was puking, who was shitting, who was crying. There was one guy that was laughing hysterically. And I'm like, man, why didn't I get that? But I was thankful that I didn't get the puking. And so I just, I kept asking. They, they tell you, like, when you purge, ask what it is, right? If you throw up in the bucket, say, what is that? So I'm, I'm crying and I'm like, what is this? And my own voice said, you have not allowed yourself to feel these things and you have put on the strong front because you thought you had to, this is fucking years. I went, who the fuck told me I, I couldn't cry? Like, why do I feel this way? And it instantly took me back to, I was five or six years old. I was pushing, I was in my backyard. I was pushing my doll or maybe the swing by itself. We had one of those old school chain link swing sets in our backyard. And so the, the swing was held together by just like a a chain with that basic plastic seat on it. Right. It was the eighties. And my mom came out on the deck and said, Lindsay, you should not push that thing without somebody in it because it's going to come back and it's going to bite you in the face or something. And you're going to get hurt. And of course, five, six year old me was like, whatever, this is super fun. I'm not listening to you. My mom went back in the house and not even three minutes later, I pushed that thing and that chain came right back up and attached itself to my lip and it ripped back out and it it ripped like a hole in my lip. And I don't remember. It's funny. I'm standing there as my 37 year old self watching my five to six year old self watching it happen. Like when I asked, why am I like this? This is what I saw. And it was like I was from the outside looking in and I could see every moment and I relived it like it was the present. And I walked my little six-year-old self up to the door and I saw my face in the sliding glass window with just blood all over it. And my mom coming out and picking me up and going, oh my God, Lindsay, and sitting me up on the counter. And when I saw my face, I started crying. Like obviously it hurt. I, the blood scared me to death and I was just crying and crying and crying. And my mom sat me up on the counter and she goes, Lindsay, you got to stop crying. I I can't see what would, what happened to your face. Like, let me see, hold on, stop crying, stop crying. And I get it right. As a mother, if Gianna came in with a bloody lip and I couldn't tell whether she had a hole or missing teeth or whatever, I would say, sweetheart, you got to stop for a minute so I can see, I, I get it. But the five to six year old version of Lindsay, all I heard that stuck in my subconscious for my entire life was you have to stop crying. And I lived with that now for 30 years. And so every time something has triggered me in my life that I would want to express feelings about or cry, it made me feel weak. And so I swallowed it and it just lived there. And that's not my mom's fault. She was doing what she should do as a parent. Same thing I would do as a parent. Just assess the situation and see if, hey, we're going to the hospital for stitches or if we can put a Band-Aid on this thing. But it's something so small that triggered this huge thing in my life that now I didn't realize I even had. And so the night continued and I just, I mean, I had to get up at that point. I got up, I walked outside, the fresh air hit me and I felt better, but I still like, I just have tears just streaming down my face. I have no control over any of it. 
I get to the grass, I put my feet on the ground and the grass feels so different. Like I can feel the vibration and the pulse of the earth. It's the weirdest thing. And I know all this stuff sounds ludicrous and absolutely bonkers, but it's so fucking true. And so I, I, as soon as my feet hit the ground and I grounded myself to the earth, I, I kind of came back into myself and, and took a deep breath and said, okay, I'm like, I, I got this. And then I looked up in the sky and the stars are the most amazing thing I've ever seen in my life. And I can see each connection to each star. And there were like four or five shooting stars at a time. I've never seen one in my life. I kept seeing them and they kept like having messages to them and saying things. And it was like, you're not broken. It's fine. Let this out. It's okay to cry. Like you, it doesn't matter that you're divorced. It doesn't matter that Gianna doesn't have a quote unquote family, like get over your shit. And then I went back down on my knees and started wailing again. Like it just came in waves. And this is the version of my purging. And it was so funny at this point because there were, you know, we're told to mind our own business. And so one of the women that I was like three or four down the line from saw me on my hands and knees fucking wailing in the grass in the middle of the, the, the damn thing. And she was like coming down for a second. She goes, Oh my God, are you? And then she goes, Nope, I'm not supposed to say anything. And she backs up and I'm like, Oh my God. So it kind of brought me out a little bit. Like I, I started laughing a little bit and I just, I went through so many stories and narratives in my head that I could take hours to explain, but I won't. I ended up in a hammock and I, had gone in and out of the room trying to just walk off some of my stuff. And then I I laid down in a hammock and I just, I surrendered to all of it because I realized at the beginning of the night, very early, the more that I fought trying to have the emotions come up, the worse it got, the the more it would just crack me open and say, no, this is, I'm, I'm, I'm healing you. I'm getting this out. There's a reason for this. And it wasn't until, I don't know how long I was out there. A shaman came and found me and said, we're doing closing circle. And I'm like, what time is it? He said, it's, it's midnight. I said, I promise you, I have been out here for five fucking years. And he just gets this big smile on his face. And I'm like, no, I'm serious. I've been out here for five years. I mean, that night felt like the longest night of my entire life. I couldn't tell you what time I started or stopped or anything. It just, it felt like years and we went back and we had closing circle and I instantly felt better, right? The shamans rebring back the energy and swoop it out of the room and kind of give you a clean slate. And we came back to the hotel room. Brian recorded his podcast. I passed out. It was probably two thirty, three 3 o'clock in the morning. We get back up at seven o'clock for yoga breakfast. I actually didn't go to yoga on a Tuesday morning. I woke up and I felt so broken and beat up and damaged and like I was never going to return to my normal self. And I looked at Ryan and I was like, I cannot do this again. There is no fucking way. Like that was the most horrific, miserable shit I have ever felt in my life. And I talked to my grandparents. I talked to my great grandparents. I talked to, I mean, I talked to people in Italian and I don't even fucking know Italian in this life, but I could speak it fluently. It was the craziest shit. I just felt so broken. I was like, there is no way I'm doing this again. No fucking way. And so Tuesday we went to the group, like the, the, like the, the get your shit together. How's everybody doing group? And everybody started sharing their stories. And funny thing is, I was not the only one who felt like a broken human on Tuesday. I was like, okay. And we're talking to people at breakfast, same thing. Like the purging was terrible for them. They went through hell. Like it just, the Monday night is the night that rips you open and breaks down all the stories, all the crap, all the things that you've been telling yourself on whatever it is, right? You you cannot lie to yourself on this medicine. It doesn't allow you to. And so when you start to break that open, you get really fucking raw and it feels really fucking terrible. And so that was, that was Tuesday. And I know you guys have heard Ryan's account, but that was mine.
that was in, in that was the first night of ayahuasca and i was convinced i was never gonna do it again yeah i'm just sitting here listening <laughs> right, i mean monday was not up for me so it was it was super easy right we we come back to the room we we'll walk down from the ceremony i'm fine ready to go to bed Lindsay's dealing with her own experience I get up Tuesday morning, like I'm good to go. I got a bunch of stuff going on, you know, work stuff happening. She's in her own place. Yeah. Then we, we get into, you know, just fast forward through the day, get into getting ready for the Tuesday night ceremony. And this is with, with Brad and oh, Scotty. Brad and Scott, Uncle Scooter, like these guys, they saved my life on Tuesday. Yeah. And this is, you know, as, as we're told who the shamans are in our first meeting, with Jerry, it's um, you know, it's the two German women. It's and it's got its own name. Then this is going deep with the boys, and Jerry makes a joke that this is not a porno. <laughs> it's not a porno. Going deep with the boys. It's not what this is. And then the third night ends up being Meg, right? Uh, the the love and energy of the mother, essentially. Sarah. S- Sarah, not Sarah. Meg. Yeah. And then the fourth night ends up being, right? The the traditional His Colombian name's... experience. I can't. It starts with an M. Mati or I don't know, but he was the traditional Colombian shaman and he was incredible. But Tuesday night, I was super hesitant to go back into the experience, right? I was like, I'm not going through that again. Who would voluntarily do this to yourself? Fuck this. See, I, I loved it. So the just as Lindsay said, the energy walking into the Maloka on Monday is heavy. Like, heavy. But it's heavy. I think a lot of it is a collective energy, the group being nervous for the experience because only six people out of 63 had had previous ayahuasca experience yeah and out of those five were here so yeah the collective energy of the group was nervous excitement apprehension plus you have the generation and years of energy of the german culture right that that transcends space and time as it pertains to these those ladies shamans. were super aggressive <laughs> yeah and, and they really were right it's just the way that we perceive their culture like they're so kind and so sweet oh and so they were nice. wonderful it's just even their tonality right very soft-spoken didn't fully have a mastery of the English language. And so of course they're gonna share their own energy with a group. And as we come into the Maloka on, on Tuesday with Brad and Uncle Scooter, oh. it it's it's light, right? It's like a lot of it is the fact that we as a collective tribe have been through this before, right? We know what's coming. We none of us died. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> sure there's the ego death, right? You you quote unquote die, but nobody actually died. And you come in and it's just a different feeling. Like they're in their mid to late thirties, they're from the U.S. They're normal guys they're that amazing. have made it the life's mission, and have probably administered more ayahuasca ceremonies than anybody else yeah. on at least this hemisphere um, over the past three years because they have consistently every week been here mm-hmm. giving giving out plant medicine. Oh. At least it ends up being two times a week, and so for me, the biggest difference on Tuesday was. Monday, there's the Icaros that the women are speaking. Oh, the Icaros kicked my ass. And they're using that to maneuver energy, and it's spoken word from them, and it's in native tongues that I certainly couldn't understand. Some were German, some weren't. I only heard ayahuasca in there, and other than that, it was gibberish, but the gibberish was killing me. Yeah, and for me, I just slept through it. So, <laughs> you know, push it forward from there. And in the second night, Brad and Scooter used music, like music that we could very clearly hear and understand yeah. so much so that Lindsay and I have been fortunate enough to procure the soundtrack essentially oh. to that evening because there's this whole thing of implanting and I'll get into that in another show and what that means <laughs> and how that works but it's just this instant memory recall of not only the way that you felt and the things that you felt but the emotions yeah. both good and bad that were presented as the waves of music were coming and going and they were moving the energy through the room and so it was just a there could not have been two more different feeling experiences where for me on Tuesday, it ended up being very introspective, right? It was the understanding that Lindsay had healed my heart when she didn't walk out on me with the mm-hmm. fact of knowing like who I've become at all costs. Like I've spent so many years working on so much of that. And if you've been along this journey with me for the past year, you've heard, right? Like not saying there's not pieces and parts that somewhere aren't deeply buried in my subconscious, but I've spent so much time and still do spend so much time picking and pulling apart myself to make sure that I am the best version of me, that I present myself as a big full version for you. If you're someone that decides to work with me, that that came to the realization as well, that yeah. 
So that entire experience, although I, I didn't have the visions and I didn't blast off in outer space and I didn't, it was just a very heady, introspective, but very peaceful, very loving, very safe and protected uh, experience for me. Yeah. So on Tuesday, Brad makes the ayahuasca. So they will tell you as you learn about the traditions of, of making the medicine, the shaman that makes it is actually their energy goes into that brew. And so Brad made the ayahuasca. It's Peruvian, I believe Peruvian tradition in origin. Um, maybe a little Colombian. I, I, I can't remember, but I, I know Peruvian and, and he made the ayahuasca and it was like, if you get a chance to come down here and meet Brad and Scooter, they are, it is nothing but pure love and, and calmness energy. Like they are the most chill, calm, loving people I have ever, ever met in my whole life and so when you walk when we walked into Maloka like that's all I felt I felt instant calm and peace and I'm like oh my god thank god and I had talked to Brad at the three o'clock um you know plant integration class and just said look I'm freaking the hell out about tonight and I'll be damned if I'm doing Monday night again like I was dying and so he gave me some really great insight and pointers and you know just talked me through a lot of it and I just said, I didn't get any of my crap. I didn't get show me who I've become or him. Like I was just trying not to break. I was broken in half and I feel broken today. And if I feel broken tomorrow, I'm out. He's like, I, I, I got you. It's okay. And so we go and experience the medicine and, and Brad blesses the ayahuasca for me. And, and I set my intentions to it. And we drink the medicine and go back and lay down. And it was the most beautiful night that I can remember having ever apart from the birth of Gianna. Like it was beautiful. And I think a lot of it had to do with Brad's energy and love and intention that he put into making the medicine and the way that the he and Scott guided the room through the experience, but everything that was broken and crumbling. And this is what Brad explained to me. Like it breaks the shell of what your ego has told you you have to be. And so most people on Monday feel very lost and feel very broken and very confused because your ego, your subconscious, the narrative that you've been living your life through wants to tell you that you can't change and this is how you have to continue to live. And the medicine is still working through you saying, no, that's not how you have to live. This is not how you have to be. This is not how you have to think. This doesn't have to be your narrative. And so it crumbles. And, it, and Tuesday night, the intention that he puts into what he makes is to sweep everything out. And he explained it as when all of that cracked, crumbly nonsense, all the stories and the bullshit and the pain and the shame and the guilt and the confusion and the fear, whatever it may be for you, when that crumbles away, there are holes left in you, right? Holes left in your soul because it's not full yet. And so they come through and fill that bitterness that is left with sweetness. And so in my intention on Tuesday, I'm like, man, show me who I've become merge me back with my soul at all costs, heal my heart. Let's get this. I, I got it. Like Brad and Scott, they've got me. <laughs> let's, let's, let's get this done. And it happened again for the first part of the night, right? I started instantly sobbing again and there were still things that needed to come out that I wasn't aware of. I had my great grandmother wrap me up and say, you're, you're going to be fine. Like this is what you needed. And just all these things that I've been telling myself in my head for years, my narrative changed that night and everything was beautiful. And I, the last little piece that I just, I couldn't stop. And I went up to the altar and I went up to Brad and I just, I knelt at his knees and I said, I need help. I can't get this last piece off. I can't get it. Like it feels stuck in my heart and I can't get it. And he took my hand and looked straight into my fucking soul. And he was like, just breathe. I'm going to help you. And I was like, holy fuck. Like I'm tearing up just thinking about it. I'm like, oh my God. Like I, I felt it. Like I could hear his words in my soul. I'm like, okay. And so he like started chanting something all around me. He blessed me with 
what do they call it? Aqua de Florita. It's this flower and herb water and that they've, they've blessed. And he started clearing out all the rest of the negative energy shit that was in me. I just started pulling it out. Like physically he was, he was putting his hands on my shoulders and my arms and my chest and my back and my head and like pulling it. Like I could feel it as he was pulling it out. And they, they use some kind of leaves that they shake around you to, to brush away the energy and to sweep out the stuff. And he just kept doing that. And as he was doing that, I sobbed harder and harder and harder and just kept going to, I could not fucking breathe. And I literally wasn't breathing. And he put his one hand on my, the front of my chest and one hand on my back. And he sat me up straight and he was like, you will breathe. And I, I was just, he was like, you are, it is fine. You will breathe. And I just went, <gasps> and that was it. Like then it was gone. It was fucking gone. And I, I looked at him and I'm like, what in the hell? And he was like, I told you, like, just surrender to it and let it go. I've got you. I'm like, oh my God. And so he walked me back to my bed and I laid down. I said, I don't want to be in my bed. I want to be outside. And so I went back outside to like outside the Maloka is this big covered yoga area. And I laid flat on my back and everything then was beautiful. It was beautiful. I was smiling. I was happy. I was listening to the music and I was just, I was in awe. And then it was that point that I was shown who I had become. And the first thing I saw was compassion. That was the, like I had become in my life compassion because I feel so much and I'm have so much empathy for other people. Like I just, I feel for them, but it was also then self-doubt right? I had for so long in my life until the last couple of years had taken other people's opinions of what they thought I should be and molded into what I th thought I should be for myself instead of just listening to what my soul told me. And so it was compassion and self-doubt. I'm like, well, fuck, those are two opposite ends of the spectrum there. What am I supposed to do with that? And so it was like, merge me back with my soul at all costs. And the voice in my head, the, the mother ayahuasca, which was my own narrative said, Lindsay, you your soul was never split from you. You've had your soul. Like you were blessed to have a solid family and parents who put you first in everything and loved you and a brother who was your best friend. And, you know, uh, just, I was so blessed, right? I heard so many people this week with so much massive trauma in their life and I didn't have any of it. And I all, almost felt bad. I didn't have addiction or abuse or molestation or anything, nothing. I had a beautiful childhood and my parents are amazing people, but they gave me shit just like every parent gives their kids shit the same way that I know Gianna will have from me, right? Not anything intentional, but just things. And so it said, you've actually not, your, your soul has never left you. You just made her so small that she could fit underneath a thimble because you never really listen to her. And then in my twenties with my first marriage, I allowed him to make me feel so small over and over and over again. Every time that I would say something or do something that, that truth, my truth was turned back around on me to make it my fault instead of accepting what my feelings were about him or my life or something. It was never his fucking fault. It was always my fault. And I started to believe that. Now, I'm not saying I never had faults, right? Everybody does. But I, I allowed him to tell me that how I felt and thought was not true. And I did that for so many fucking years that my soul got so small she could fit in the thimble. Get the fuck out of here. I was blown away. And so the minute that I said, well, how the fuck do I fix that? I saw the thimble come off that small version of me, right? That like 18 year old self, that 1920, it wasn't a child, Lindsay. It was like the naive Lindsay that didn't know better yet. That didn't really know how to listen to her voice. And I went, fuck, I'm so sorry. I didn't listen to you for years. Right. And this stuff, like Ryan's looking at me, it makes me tear up because how many people are not listening to their soul? Like you're don't that voice that you hear 
that intuition, that is your soul fucking yelling at you to do something different. Listen to it because the more that you don't listen to it, you kill it. And then you don't have that voice and it, it splits you from a part of yourself. And so that it, in that one moment, I was instantly merged right back with her. Like I felt it. I could feel it jump right back into my heart. And then the third part of it was, you know, heal my heart. And so at that point, I'm like, God, I don't know how to do this. And I started to think about it and I started to get stuck and I started to get in this spin like, oh my God, I don't, I don't know if I can do this. I don't, I don't know how to listen. I don't know how to heal my heart. I've been doing this for so long. I don't, you know, I don't know. It was at that moment that Scooter, Scott, you know, he, his name is Scott. We call him Uncle Uncle Scooter. He came out outside of the Maloka and I was laying flat on my back, arms above my head, legs spread out, just probably looked like I was fucking dying. And he came out and started blessing me again with the, with the herb water and the chanting and the leaves and the things. And it instantly like that was at the point that my heart started to put itself back together. And I was like, he started to fill those holes for me. I'm like, what? How did you know? I looked at him like, oh my God, thank you. How did you know? He goes, I heard you calling me. I said, I didn't say anything. He goes, no, honey, your soul was calling me. I'm like, holy fuck, these people, like Jesus. I, I, then I, then I was crying, but it was like tears of joy because he had helped me put myself back together. Like my soul called for him. He knew it. He felt it in the, on the other side of the Maloka. I wasn't anywhere near him. I wasn't saying a word. And he came and he sought me out because that is his true gift on this earth. And he saw it and he fucking fixed me. And I would have not made it through like I would have stayed with that hole. And so from that point, I got up. I was smiling. I was like walking around in the grass and looking at the stars. And I went to the fire and I threw all my shit into the fire. They tell you to sit down at the fire and the fire is this grandfather energy to tell them your first, your full name, your parents' full name, and then give the fire all the things that you don't want. So I gave the fire my self-doubt, my reactionary nature, my negative mindset, right? Like get it the fuck out. I don't want it. I don't need it. It doesn't serve me. Like I've not been listening to myself enough. I've been doubting myself too, too much. I've been listening too much to what others say, even though I, I say I don't, right? And I don't to some extent, but there's always that little seed that gets planted that I allow to sit there and then it creeps into my subconscious and it creeps into my narrative. It's like, fuck, I'm not going to let anybody do that for me anymore. Whether it be my friends, my family, my husband, my parents don't care. It's my fucking voice and my fucking life and I'm going to do it for myself. And so I just gave the fire all of that. And the rest of the night was beautiful. The music was amazing. It just, it flowed. They, they played the medicine through your body within the music. It was, it was absolutely gorgeous. Tuesday night was the most amazing night that I have ever had in my life. And I found who I had become. I merged back with my soul and I healed my heart. And so on Rhythmia Technicality, I got my miracle. I was able to heal myself and the medicine was able to work through me. Now I saw all kinds of things and I talked to all kinds of people. And I mean, just you could take hours to explain it, but it doesn't make sense unless you have experienced it yourself. And I, I did see Ryan, I think at one point on Tuesday, but honestly, you're so involved in what is going on for you and trying to get your own gifts with the medicine experience that I knew that if there's something was really wrong, that I was going to feel it. And so I just let him have his experience while I had mine. And there were, of course, again, Tuesday night, people puking all around the most insane noises out of humans I've ever heard in and out of the bathroom, right? Because the, the diet is coming out one, one way or the other, it's vomiting or diarrhea. And luckily again, on, on Monday and Tuesday, I didn't have any vomiting or diarrhea. Like I just, the, the sobbing was my purging. And so I was able to just come to closing ceremony and feeling whole and relieved and Oh my God, that was beautiful. And I walked back to our 
room with a smile on my face the whole time. And I went to sleep with a smile on my face and I woke up with a smile on my face. And Wednesday morning, I didn't feel broken or a shell of a human at all. I felt the most whole and beautiful and put together I have ever felt in my life. And I think a majority of people felt like that Tuesday morning because breakfast with the group was so different and everybody sharing their experiences and we're all laughing because you know we're strangers and now it's like you know I've seen you puke in a bucket and I've seen you run into the bathroom and you know I heard you laughing and I heard you screaming at your dad and I just all kinds of stuff that you just you share these amazing things with these strangers that become a part of your soul instantly because you've all been through this incredible experience together and much different on my side I didn't see one person puke. I didn't see any of those things all week. Like I was in my own world and my own space. Tuesday was a great night for me, introspective. I certainly heard the sound, right? I heard the sobbing and the yelling and the whining and the crying and the, the vomiting is not vomiting like you would see when someone has a flu. Oh no. The vomiting is not like someone might have experienced when you've had too much to drink. Like the buckets end up having the the ayahuasca is this maroonish red color. And as the week progressed, both Lindsay and I noticed, really the whole tribe here, that by the time we get to Thursday, really Friday morning, Thursday's medicine is a purging medicine with intentionality. However, there was no stench in this room, right? The windows are open. The sun's up. It's 85 degrees. It's like it's not normal vomit. It's like this red liquid, which is obviously some ayahuasca, but it's it's the repressed energy and emotion that we've felt for so many years that we have just swallowed down. Yeah. So it doesn't come out as like it doesn't come out as actual vomit. And they tell you like you're not getting sick, right? When someone said, well, I got sick, you know, I puked. You're not getting sick. You're actually getting well because you're getting that sickness out. And it's not, you're not vomiting because you have norovirus. You're vomiting because that repressed emotion needs to come out. And so it, it has no smell to it. No. And so, you know, just fast forward based off of brevity, we got to be able to get out of the resort at 11 and it's, it's 10 something right now as we're recording. <laughs> I could this. talk about this for hours. You know, fast forward into Wednesday evening and Wednesday is the night that I, I blast it off. Oh like, Yeah the most out of control, we can call it ego, death, separation, healing, solving, confusion, understanding, like my story. Your face. It will still take me (laughs) months to be able to get this out the way that it actually felt inside. But from the base level of just laughing uncontrollably, right? The first dosage didn't do anything. It had made a, a new friend here, Luke Sellers, who is one of the I called assistant shaman, somebody that that was you know assisting with the journey, also a, a teacher here. It was next to him. He was sitting in a chair. I was on a bed. He goes, man, this medicine's pretty light tonight. It's not really a heavy thing. You should double up. You should do two doses right off the oh, rip. Oh yeah. And then do t- two doses when they call you back, and maybe even ask for a third. He goes, you, you'll be able to handle with your weight. This was the same brew. This was the same batch as Monday. So I was a little fucking nervous because Monday was hell for me. And you like, went all in. I'm like, all right, buddy. So it went up. I'm like, yeah, I'd like two. The shaman gives me two. I come back an hour and a half later. I ask for two more. <laughs> and then next thing I know, I am basically outside in the grass, <laughs> <laughs> being woken up, having very little ability to fully, like I know where I'm at. It's not like this isn't a drunk. This isn't out of it. It's just like there's such a disconnection. Like I, I made mention during the shows this week, it was like I was in the control tower of my body, but I knew what I was supposed to do. I knew where I was at, but it's like I wasn't moving the joysticks the right way to get my legs to move in in synchronistic order. I wasn't able to lift up my arms the right way. I was just sitting like, man, this is a wild experience. But your experience, you went light on Wednesday. So I went, yeah. So I only had one full cup on Monday and one full cup on Tuesday because I was, I, I didn't, I'm a lightweight when it comes to Tylenol. I mean, I just, I, I don't take medicine well. I don't take medicine ever. So I, when they called for the second cup the first night, I was, I was sobbing and broken. I don't even think I heard it. I saw you walk up and I just was in my own little world. And I'm like, there's, I tried to get off the bed and I just couldn't, I just kept 
sobbing. So I was like, I'm probably good. Tuesday night, um, actually Brad and Scooter were like, do you want a second cup? And I'm like, nope. Like, I feel so good right now. And this was after like Scott had came out and find me and Brad had healed me. And I was just like, nope, I'm good. Like, I feel amazing. I, I feel like I will not do myself a service if I have a second cup. So Wednesday, because it was the same medicine as Monday, I was really nervous. And Sarah, the shaman on, on, um, Wednesday, she's here throughout the week. Like she did a yoga class on Monday and I mean, she's just a beautiful soul. Again, these shamans are so talented and so amazing. And I talked to her and I said, look, same medicine. I wanted to just freaking die on Monday. I was so broken on Tuesday morning. I can't do that again. I had such a beautiful experience last night, like on Tuesday night coming into Wednesday. I feel so whole and complete. I, I'm either not going to do it or I need a suggestion. She's like, take a half a cup. Like, don't, don't take the full cup, take a half a cup. And so that's what I did. I took a half a cup on Wednesday and it, again, it was beautiful. I, I, just had the most amazing experience. There are no words. There just are no words. It was beautiful. And it was exactly what it, it was. Continued healing of my heart, continued healing of my soul. My intention was, um, I said gently, they said, you can say gently, you know, in, in case you had a really rough time. And because I had a rough time on Monday, I said, gently, I said, just gently show me who it is that I should be like, what are my next steps? And that was my intention Wednesday and Thursday. Like, gently show me what is next. Um, and so for Wednesday, it was the affirmation or the reaffirmation that I, at my soul's level, am a healer, right? That's why I was in medicine for so long and veterinary medicine for so long. And that's why I chose to do critical care and internal medicine, all the things that are brutal and terrible other rather than general practice where I would you know, get to work with happy puppies, getting vaccines and nails trims with ear infections, right? I, I chose the brutal stuff because that's where I felt called to because I wanted to heal them. Like I am a healer. And so as it's telling me my next steps, like you are still a healer because you are continuing now with, with healing people, right? And it's, it's not in a medical setting because that has served you. It is healing people and showing them how to heal themselves. And that is, that is your gift. Like that is your path. You are, you are a healer. And so whatever path that you choose to take that healing on, you have been a healer for lifetimes. And Wednesday was also the, the time that I was shown that Ryan and I as souls have been connected for many lifetimes and not just this one, that my brother and I have been siblings for many lifetimes and not just this one. And that the souls that were in that room and in with us here at Rhythmia all week, I have been connected to in one way or the other and for lifetimes. And we're talking like past lives here, right? Like it shows you, you get these weird slide effects of things that you've been through and places that you've been in previous lives that you've had. And honestly, walking into this shit, I was like, past lives? You got to be kidding me. There's past lives. Come on. You guys, I saw it. I could smell it. I was there. I felt it like it's crazy. And you just, you can't believe it. You can't comprehend it until you have been through it. And believe me, I was the biggest critic. I have never touched a quote unquote drug in my whole life. And this is not, uh, this is not a drug. It truly is a medicine. The way that it is played and worked through your body with the shamans and the ancient traditions, like this is what medicine was hundreds and hundreds of years ago. Like this is what they did. This is how they healed you. It's the most amazing thing to feel connected to yourself, to others, to the planet, and to know that things truly are all encompassing and all one. And the petty shit that you worry about in your life doesn't fucking matter. Like all the stuff who got the designer bags and the fancy tennis shoes. And you got to be fucking kidding me. None of this stuff matters. You can't take it with you. It serves no purpose. Like I have shoes on my feet. You know what I wore this week? I wore a $6 and 78 cent pair of sandals that I got at Walmart because what the fuck did I need my Tory Burch sandals for that were $200? 
they still cover and protect my feet and I was still able to walk on them. And the, the energy exchange of money is just that it's just an energy exchange and it's just stuff. And I didn't feel any different walking around in my Walmart sandals than I did in my Tory Burch ones. Like give me a fucking break. None of it fucking matters. So you can show off your fancy cars and your designer bags. And if that's what you love, fine, but it will not serve. Like it does not serve you in life. It's crazy to come to the understanding. Cause trust me, I love my fucking Louis bags, but they don't mean anything. It's just fucking stuff. It has no meaning on the soul level. And when it comes to the connectedness in the universe, in the world, none. Correct. <laughs> and it, it, what's interesting, right, is obviously that so much of that to me is a disassociation of, of soul, right, of ego, and realizing that so many things that I personally had done throughout my life were this necessity for comparison, and comparison ends up being an ego's journey, right, needing to compare for, for placement, needing to compare for judgment, needing to compare for hierarchy, right, which even on Wednesday night got into why did we ever decide to develop state lines? Like who decided the way that states are shaped? Why is it that it has to be, I live here and you live there and that we compete against each other? And, and this will all tie into, of course, the fact that we're all one in some capacity. And don't get me wrong, I'm not saying in any way, shape, or form that you shouldn't work hard, aspire for great things. If material possessions are the things that drive you towards, towards greatness and use them as fuel for your fire. But the fact of being able to have those for so long in my own life actually be a crippling hindrance to my success because I felt like if I didn't make enough money to go buy the new M5 or the new Panamera Turbo or the new Audemars Piguet watch or take the private jet or buy the new house, that I was less than, that I wasn't able to, to produce at the level that other people were so I became inferior. Well, that's really not true. There, there is no comparison. The gifts that they are receiving and the work that they're doing and the wealth that they've accumulated is incredible for them. But it doesn't have to mean that they are less or more than me. They are just them. And so we fast forward now into Thursday night's culmination of experience. Right? And Thursday night is this whole different deal, which... I think admittedly we're probably gonna have to hop back on and do a, a secondary wrap up right? with what Thursday looks like and, and all the magic that happened there. And I will draw this to a conclusion only based off of it being a little more than an hour long. We have to be out of our room in 20 minutes. There's no way for us to tell the story of Thursday and then into Friday. So I'll pause on the last ayahuasca experience touch base back on the the massages that were incredible touch base on the the fitness facility here with the hot and cold pools touch base on the mud stuff that we did right we got to cover ourselves in mud and have it dry and it was a, a, a pretty incredible experience and then even going into town right we went into uh what's the town tamarino yeah we went to tamarino and it was, I mean, we'll cover all the fun stuff. Like they have dogs here. Like I had a dog join me on my journey, right? When you're going through a rough time, like the shamanic dogs, they're fucking ridiculous. These dogs seek out people that need a little comfort. And because, right, I'm the animal person. That dog was on my bed a couple of times and she would stay until I was good. And then she would go to somebody else. Like you hear about the dogs in the hospitals that go to the, the sick people or the people that need the, the good, pure love and energy. They just know like this place is so magical. There are no words to describe it. And we certainly cannot, you know, say enough good things about it. So we will wrap this up for today and encourage you. Oh, Ryan's shaking his head at me. No, don't, don't wrap it up. He's tying his shoes. We're trying to get ready. I, I asked you not to wrap it up because there has been additional pieces and parts of this journey that have now come to the forefront of Lindsay and I's life. And that is the opportunity to have a bigger role in the growth of Rhythmia. And some of that role and responsibility and some of just what I, what I want to do, what my soul field calls to do, called to do is to come down here every 12 weeks or so. And when this launches, I'll make sure in the show notes to say when we're coming back. But Jerry has so graciously agreed to 
help me help you get here. And so if you're curious and you'd like to come with Lindsay and I and experience what we have experienced, this will be a once a quarter deal for, for us, certainly for me, right? And then give us a chance to also bond and connect with you, lead you into this journey on a coaching protocol uh, that will come complimentary, just something that we do because we feel compelled to. And then to see the breakthroughs that we make when we're here as a, as a collective group will be something that We'll start to create a ripple in the world through the butterfly effect that will impact the global populace with some plans that Jerry has that I get to play an additional role in. And so please shoot us an email, ryan at lifeoptimizationgroup.com or lindsay at lifeoptimizationgroup.com for more information, more insight, more details, ask us questions, expense, travel, the things. We're going to give you the honest rundown because it has changed our lives completely. And with that, my friends, I will encourage you to go out today and get shit done.